whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, am I on? Yeah. Loud enough? Is it loud enough? Because this is the last time I'm ever telling this story. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that inspiration is the key to making art. Everybody is an artist. Everybody can be an artist. But what separates a great artist from the ordinary is what we call inspiration. I was born in 1936 in Bronx, New York. And we were just coming out of the Depression, and my father had made himself a pushcart. And he went every morning to market and filled up the pushcart with fruits and vegetables. Poor men worked day and night, and they were struggling to make a living and provide for their children. But they didn't have time to care for their children. And so in that sense, I felt that I was abused. Not so much deliberately, but because my mother was sick. My father was overworked. And how do you overcome that kind of, of abuse when you don't have anybody to guide you? Well, what I did was I got a shoebox and I drew a mother and a father and a daughter and a son and, and I colored them and I cut them out and I put them in my shoebox. And whenever I'd had too much, I would bring out my shoebox and play with my new family. So I found my away place by drawing and painting. And of course I was very lucky because I had a teacher who recognized my talent. So the teacher took me to the Art Students League, which is a very famous liberal art school in New York City in Manhattan. And many of the great artists taught there. And some of the great artists went there to paint and be mentored. At the age of nine, they put me in a children's class on Saturday where you had to do still lives. And I did a Michelangelo statue and she said, okay. She said, there's no point keeping you in the children's class. I'm gonna send you to the life class. And that's my first experience drawing. Then I got into the high school of music and art. And I scored so high on the test that they had to revamp their entire curriculum because they didn't feel it was adequate for what I was bringing. They wanted me to do some childlike stuff and I was way beyond that already, you know. I didn't stay very long. I did a year at Music and Art and then I fell in love and got married. <laughs> I left. And I got pregnant and had a beautiful child. So here I am at 15, now a mother wondering what I'm supposed to do next because this wasn't exactly what I had envisioned for myself. Marriage lasted about two years and then we would just sit around being terribly bored with each other. <laughs> Not a clue what to do next so we decided to separate. And I remember my mother coming over to my house and saying, you know, where's your husband? I said, well, he's gone. Gone where? Just, you know, gone. It's over. And one day, a heavy-set black man came along who also lived in the building that I was in, and he would sit down on the bench next to me and he would talk to me about metaphysical things, about the spiritual world, about music, about art. And basically, he mentored me and opened my eyes to a world that I never knew existed. And his name was Charlie Mingus. He was a great jazz musician and somewhat of an icon these days. And then I found an apartment in Greenwich Village on uh, Christopher Street. I began to experience the world, you know, from my own independent uh, point of view. Well, it seems that I was there when Bob Dylan was there, and Joan Baez, and Joan Collins, Jackson Pollock. And Lee Krasner was with him, and I knew her very well, and uh, Wilhelm de Kooning. Just everybody. Just finding their way, and it was 
the kind of thing like, what are you going to do when you, when you grow up and become famous? Something sent me to a job agency that was looking for the right hand to one of the first women executives in a department store. Taking over a new place called EJ Corvette and they were a raging success and they were expanding faster than they could keep up and so they hired Eve Nelson to do their promotion and publicity and she needed an assistant. And she said, well, uh, what are your abilities? Can you do this? Can you do that? I've never had a desk job in my life. She said, well, there's no point in asking you anything more. You have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. Can you start tomorrow? <laughs> and of course. And I was with her and with the department store for eight years and we opened 14 new stores she and I did all the publicity and the advertising and the parties. At which point I was more interested in drawing and painting. So she asked me one day, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to paint or do you want to keep working for me? And I said, well, I think it's time that I quit working and painted full time. And so I left my home virtually. I'd been there for eight years and got into bed and stayed there for about three months because I didn't know what I was supposed to do next. I couldn't get out of bed, you know. So I decided, well, I'll go into this Greenwich Village outdoor art show with my drawings and this painting. A very dignified gentleman approached me. He said, you know, I really like your painting. <laughs> He said, um, do you have another one? I said, well, no, but I probably could do one. <laughs> okay. He said, well, if you do, he said, I'd like to buy everything you paint. I started painting. Mothers and children and women, beautiful feminist women, looking very independent and windblown. And he would come and he would pick them up and he'd give me money. I said, I am really on to something here, you know. But also while I was in that show, a Frenchman came by, very dignified, very interesting, and said, I really love what you're doing. He said, I think you are a remarkable draftsman. You're probably one of the best of the younger generation that I've seen. And he introduced himself, and his name was Marcel Duchamp. And so he began to mentor me from that point on and really encouraged me. He taught me something that made it all the difference in my life, literally transformed how I thought about the making of art, and that was adding other dimensions, such as time and space. And so what he was applying, as he did in his painting, New Descending a Staircase, was what he was striving to do was to show that when you make a painting or even a sculpture, you want to apply a moment in time, which is the current moment, a reference to a moment past and a reference to the moment to come. And if you can achieve that, you've added two other dimensions to the two-dimensional surface that you're trying to make three-dimensional. And I think because of that advice, I succeeded admirably. At that point, I met my next husband. His name was Ed. He became my agent and my representative. And uh, it was you know, just a match made in heaven. And we were together for 40 years. And I told Ed, that these gentlemen had offered me this deal in Los Angeles and then this other guy wanted to offer me a deal and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And he made a phone call. The next thing I know, we're in, in LA. 
And I did all these editions of lithographs on this amazing press that Lyndon Kistler had built. They were all individually signed and numbered by me. And then when they were done, the lithograph image was removed, never to be printed again. And that makes them very, very rare. I found out at that time it was such a new thing for Americans to be able to approach a real artist real live artist, and uh, there was a huge market created. It just was in the right place at the right time. Anyway, after we moved back to New York, we opened a gallery on Madison Avenue, and I was the first woman to ever have her own gallery on Madison Avenue. I had a tremendous celebrity clientele. In addition to commissions to paint Marilyn Monroe and uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson, I also painted Martha Ray. So Martha Ray was a comedian who was very friendly with Bob Hope and she became my son's godmother and she had a huge collection and one of my dearest fans and devotees. Jackie Kennedy used to walk past my gallery all the time, and uh, what I did was I put a piece of chiffon that was hand-painted in the window, and one day Jackie Kennedy came in and she asked me to design a dress for her to go to a ball. I started to get noticed by the society columnists and the fashion columnists. And one day, New York News did a, this article, which was my first, when I opened the gallery in Madison Avenue, and I am wearing a hand-painted jacket with this same image hand-painted on it, making an art gallery out of your closet by painting on clothes. A manufacturer came. It turned out that he had wedding dresses that he would get orders for and that he'd manufacture them and not all of the ones he manufactured sold. And he brought them to me, brought me maybe 80 dresses, and uh, wanted me to figure out a way to paint them. And he put them in his showroom, and the dress sold out. He started selling it all over again. And they started featuring them in all the newspapers <laughs> with my name, and I signed every dress, mind you. So then I decided well, it was time I created my own collection. Charles James, who's in that book, was one of the greatest designers, and he, had, he was mentoring me. And he knew all the tricks of the trade and all the little details the tailors need to know and how to raise the shoulders and how to lift the waist and the, lower the waist in the back and all these little things that you need to know. And I observed those in the collection that I made, so when the buyers looked at the comments, they were extremely satisfied because all those little French scenes and all these little details. And I designed a line of a crepe de chine silk separates. And I was very good friends with Jane Russell and we introduced my collection at the big ball. It's called WAIF, W-A-I-F, I-S-S, International. Had all the fashion editors there and they started featuring them in all the newspapers <laughs> with my name. And we started getting working for Sassoon Jeans and Gloria Vanderbilt shirts and Hathaway and everybody you could think of, Oscar de la Renta. And we had 600 artists eventually working for us, copying the designs that I originated. Then I did the same thing with the home furnishing. Designed the collection of pillows and bedspreads and shower curtains and we made even more money than the dresses. It was just crazy. It was a huge business. After a while I decided this is ridiculous. I don't want to keep doing this. <laughs> we sold the business and took off. <laughs> we jumped in a truck and took a ride <laughs> west. <laughs> we opened a gallery in Palm Desert and we had it for 10 years. People would walk through and look at everything and they'd say, you know, I feel like you took me on a journey. 
And then my husband would approach them and say, which one would you like to take home with you? <laughs> and they would walk out and, well, and buy something they couldn't leave without being part of this journey that my husband and I had been on. For whatever the reason, people who collected my work never put it back on the market. They loved the work and it became part of their, their home and part of their family and part of something they really loved and cherished. It wasn't easy being a, an artist at the, in those times. Being a, a woman artist was even harder. And I think I was part of that whole movement to liberate women in their thinking and in their capabilities and belief in themselves and to find a way to express themselves that is meaningful and honest and true and in doing so has not only showed the way for women but also enlightened men. Along the way I was lucky enough to find mentors who understood and appreciated who I was and you know that I created Making Your Mark to overcome those inner critics that don't allow artists, even though they're artists and working at their craft, still have an inner critic who's saying, well, you, you can't do that. Because you don't want to be condemned, you don't want to be judged, and you're inhibited. And I found that through a very simple measure, which is getting dirty with charcoal seems to open a pathway to meeting your silent stranger who's that true part of yourself. And yet there are people who still won't touch the charcoal. Yeah, can't do it. And the ones who do do it find images that they never dreamed just by making marks on paper or on canvas, letting everybody know, oh, I was here. This is the mark that I made, nobody else. You have to look for and go one step beyond. It doesn't matter how well you've expressed yourself or how much you think you're finished with a particular piece. There's always that extra thing that needs to be done that will take it to another level, even if it's just picking up a brush and swiping it in a free movement that involves your whole body and your whole soul and your whole sense of everything. And you have the feeling that something greater than yourself has taken over and is allowing you to do this form of self-expression. Go with your gut, be true to yourself. Don't worry about what anybody thinks and create your own expression and you have to be the final judge. And if you want to be successful, there's a very simple formula. It boils down to one thing and one thing only. You have to do the work. It's as simple as that. You do the work and the universe will take over and wonderful things will happen with it. You don't do the work, all you have are wishes and dreams. And I was very lucky because I had a husband who not only represented me, but he, under, he wasn't competitive with me. And he understood that I was given a gift. And with that gift comes an obligation. And that obligation is to share it as genuinely and honestly as you know how. And it was his job to make sure that that's what I did. And I used to say, well, he just created what I call a garden of creative delights where I lived. And he lived in the, in the outside world with all the greed and the dealing with all the nonsense and everything else. And what I think the importance of my career has been is to inspire other people to be inspired and not to be afraid of their creativity. And when you are inspired, somehow, 
you know how to do these things. You, you know what tools to use. You know what mediums to use. It's as if it, it's all known to you. And if people would leave themselves open to experience that, they too can be the creators that we're meant to be. We are a very creative you know, race of people. I have tried all my life to ex use art to express beauty, the beauty of the human spirit. And I think art has served me well in that, in that regard. I'm a painter. I'm a draftsman. I'm a sketcher. I'm a lithographer. I'm a graphic artist, a fashion designer, a home furnishings designer. Oh, and I didn't even tell you about the sculptures, larger than life. <laughs> Can't think of anything else that I haven't done. <laughs>